Let's talk about Kim Potter. Kim Potter is the police officer uh, who's now on trial for having shot Dante Wright to death, um, where she clearly mistook her her taser for her gun, or I guess her gun for her taser. And um, sure. you can hear her on the tape saying, T- I'm going to tase you, taser, taser, taser. And then she shoots with her firearm and he dies. And it's obviously a tragic accident, but the prosecutor there has decided to treat it as a crime. She's charged with first and second degree manslaughter. And uh, boy, they are in a battle there in that courtroom. I mean, both sides are fighting it out. Um, This is the case in which the prosecution had, uh, I'm sorry, the judge had some lunatic show up at her house trying to videotape her. She spoke to that uh, just the other day saying it was an effort to intimidate me. Good luck. Um, And the guy who did it was arrested. But anyway... A new piece of videotape now showing Kim Potter after the shooting. We've all seen the taser, taser, taser. Here's a new piece of videotape showing her right after that upset. And hear how her fellow officer, Officer Johnson, tries to console her. Listen, there's a lot of crying, and then we'll get to the dialogue. Just breathe. That guy was trying to take off with me in the car. There you have it. I mean, I don't know, Mark. I think the average person looks at that and says, why are we char- charging her again? She she screwed up. But, like, how is it criminal? You know, there's um, I, I've been on, obviously, the criminal defense side. I also do. A uh, probably half of my practice are suing police agencies in situations where people have been wrongly killed. And I've watched police officers almost uniformly get acquitted or have the judge dismiss at a probable cause proceeding. It's very, very difficult to ever convict a police officer. This case, I think, um, is uh, is very tough for the prosecution. Um, and the this tape, and I'm glad you played it, certainly gives, um, you know, people often say, well, they didn't show remorse or they didn't understand or they there wasn't they didn't act right. I, you know, we I've spent a career defending people who didn't act right. I mean, mm-hmm. clearly here, this is somebody who's in the throes of uh, a great deal of angst. And I think that that is going to probably carry the day for him. Because remember, other than people who are famous, P- uh, police officers are the only other category of people that truly get a presumption of innocence. Mm, interesting. You know, to me, it boils down to the what are the instructions going to be to the jury? Because if the judge tells the jury that she can't have behaved recklessly, which is required to prove first or second degree, um, she, she, if she can't have de- de- uh, behaved recklessly it, without knowing she was taking a dangerous risk, you know what I mean? If she, if it was a true accident, she didn't realize she was pulling out a firearm and shooting, then I don't see how she gets convicted. Andrew Branca, uh, who's been amazing, he's great. He writes over at um, LegalInsurrection.com. They were amazing during the Rittenhouse trial, and everything Andrew said was right. Um, he put it as follows. I was like, this is exactly it. He says, the critical question is this. Is the state required to prove that Kimberly Potter was aware that she was holding a firearm in her hand in order to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that her conduct in handling it was reckless and manslaughter? Do they have to prove... She was aware that she was holding a firearm. The defense is their position is that you cannot be engaged in reckless conduct that you do not know you are engaged in. Right. Like you don't you don't know you're firing a gun and the judge hasn't hasn't instructed the jury and it hasn't and she hasn't given either side guidance on how this is going to come down. I kind of wonder, like it it all comes down to which way she rule, how how she uh, informs on recklessness. Well, one of the problems is, and we've been arguing this in uh, California state court for years, the difference between the state of mind for what's called an implied malice murder, you know, the, the difference in homicide between murder and manslaughter is whether there's malice. Well, 
There's also what's called implied malice. If you act in such a way, the law will imply that you had the malice for murder. Um, I've often argued, and there's, I'm not alone here, that sometimes the state of mind when the jury gets the instruction on one of these manslaughter charges is very misleading. And, and a jury doesn't know what to do with it. And here you've got I can understand why the judge is not giving guidance, so to speak, because they have what are called pattern instructions. They've got instructions that have been either affirmed or uh, blessed, if you will, by the appellate courts. But she probably, in this case, wants to hear how the evidence comes out and then tailor it Mm. to that and tailor the instruction of that. But it's a horrific job for jurors, for lay people, to have to kind of parse through the language, which never is very clear, and then yeah. put that in context of what am I going to do with a police officer who didn't go out there with the intention to do the killing? Um, and so that's a, you know, I, God forbid that you're one of those jurors. It's interesting because the defense seems to be hedging its bets. They're going to argue that she didn't have a state of mind at all intending to kill anybody. Obviously, she didn't intend to fire her her gun. I think we can all give her that based on what we've seen, although some people aren't. But they also seem to be kind of hedging by saying, even if she did intend to fire the gun, she had cause because um, the, she, the guy, Dante Wright, was, uh, was driving away with an officer in the car, half in the car. Here is, so they, what, what the prosecution did was they put on... Um, Officer Lucky, who was a three year officer who she she Kim Potter was supposed to be training that day. Um, And he was a prosecution witness sort of talking about his experience and what he saw. And then the defense attorney got up there and in like 20 minutes, seamless little boom, 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 cross examination, got out the following um, testimony. Let's listen to it. There's a voice that appears and says, Kim, that guy was trying to take off with me in the car. Remember hearing that? Yes. Whose voice was that? Sergeant Johnson's voice. Is this a high crime area for guns as well? Yes. And for drugs? Yes. And your intuition is formulated um, by a number of things, but among them is that you've been in this area all your life. Yes. And know the streets as well as anybody. Yes. And you ran the plates, uh, found that uh, the tabs were stale, and then um, you had a reason to stop the car. Is that right? Yes. So you wanted to find out what was going on? Yes. Because you had an intuition that something else was going on besides the tabs? Yes. Okay. You didn't quite know, but you were curious? Yes. Okay. And there was <clears throat> uh, nothing wrong with uh, you stopping the car for the reasons you said you stopped it, right? Correct. No. So he's just he's basically just trying to set up it was a proper stop. You were following order and that this was an area that was known for problematic, you know, crimes and, and criminals and so on. And, you know, you also get out the fact he's, that the one officer was half in the car when he tried to take off. It's a it's a technique that was used by the defense lawyer that he's probably uh, been uh, gored by that uh, countless times by prosecutors who go through that same litany um, when they're trying to convict one of his clients. I mean, I've heard that kind of this is a high crime area. This is why you had an intuition. This is why you did it. Blah, blah, blah. That's that. That's normally what the prosecutor would do here, because you have a cop who's on trial. They the other cop is going to support your theory. You're being the, the defense lawyer and is going to give you what you want which is exactly what he just did right there. And by the way, you're absolutely correct, Megan, because what this does is even if you think that she that she isn't being truthful when she says she had a gun, um, that even with a gun, there is, the, you know, she had a reasonable doubt as to what was happening there and whether or not she could use the force that she used. 